Here's an edgy one. Uh, Dusan Milevich asks, why does this system that you advocate as superior still isn't succeeding in winning in the market? Do you have some idea as to realization of your theory? And then, do you agree that your son, Patrick, has outdone you, especially because he insists that it is a theory without serious ambitions to becoming a reality, to say the least? Uh, quite a long time ago, I gave a talk on Robert Nozick's book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, with Nozick in the audience. And we had an exchange afterwards. And he did not try to defend the argument against anarchy that he makes in that book, which is what I was criticizing. He instead made the argument that if what I was describing was a viable set of institutions, why didn't we observe it? Which I think is, in fact, the strongest argument against my position. And I think the answer I gave, the answer I usually give, is to imagine that it's 1800, and somebody is proposing a really wildly crazy impossible political system in which all adults get to vote, even women, in which the legal rights of men and women are the same, of blacks and whites are the same. Furthermore, one of the less attractive features of this imaginary system is that governments are so large that they spend 30 or 40 percent of all income. Uh, no such society had ever existed in the history of the world, and yet that's now the normal arrangement for developed uh, societies. So things do change, and they change for a variety of reasons that we understand very well, but the constraints that determine what's politically stable uh, vary quite a lot uh, over time, depending on culture and economics and technology and a lot of other things. So I don't think you can rule out something because it doesn't exist at the moment. Now, beyond that, I think the most likely context for my ideas to be implemented is in cyberspace, not in real space. And I've written various things pointing out that public key encryption makes possible a cyberspace which is protected by very strong privacy, in which the state cannot observe what you are doing. Nobody can observe what you're doing except the people you voluntarily associate with. Uh, and in that context, you could end up with essentially something like anarcho-capitalism online, although enforcement would be by reputation rather than by force in that system and uh, state in real space. And that if things develop so that enough of our life is in cyberspace, then people become very mobile because you can move your geographic location and keep the same friends and the same job because they're all online. And the more mobile people are, the more governments have to act like firms competing for customers in order to keep their taxpayers. And that might give you a substantial shift towards a freer society. Uh, but I'm not in the prophecy business. I don't know if what I'm doing will work or not. Uh, I think Patry is certainly correct that you want to think about whether the institutions you want will come into existence. I should point out that his seasteading proposal comes out of an example in the machinery of freedom mm -hmm. where I discuss what would happen in a world where people were perfectly mobile. Uh, I think seasteading is a neat idea. Like most neat ideas, it probably won't work, but it might. And if it did, it would produce very attractive, very attractive outcomes. And there may be other ways of getting to what we want that I haven't really thought about. Uh, so, you know, the world is a very complicated place. Uh, one of my books is called Future Imperfect, and it explores the implications over the next few decades of a variety of technological revolutions that might happen. And one of the conclusions is that the future is much less certain than most people assume. That the world of even 30 years from now, and certainly 50 or 70 years from now, is likely to be very different from the present world, and we don't really know in what ways. Which is one reason why it's worth thinking about alternatives. There's an argument my father made a long time ago, which has been distorted by various critics, which is that it's worth putting into circulation ideas that are not politically viable at present. And one reason is that when a society gets into serious trouble, then people are willing to look at a wider range of alternatives and they may implement ideas that were outside of the range of, of plausible things at an early time. 
So from that standpoint, really, I view what I'm doing as trying to work out and put into circulation a set of ideas of how societies might run, and there may or may not be circumstances that with those ideas get into it. What path do you see as helpful to achieving a free society that you envision? The, through political action and even violent revolution, or through government avoidance, such as Bitcoin, seasteading, and etc.? I think violent revolution is usually a mistake unless you have a very bad situation because most people think of the fundamental function of government as protecting them from getting killed, beaten up, raped, robbed, and so forth. In a violent revolution, lots of people are getting beaten up, killed, robbed, and so forth, and that tends to make people want more government rather than less. Uh, so uh, I don't think that's, you know, I could imagine a situation where government is bad enough that you've got no alternative, but I think as a general rule, that's not a sensible strategy. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think there is one correct strategy. I think one of the mistakes, if you look at political movements, not just libertarians, they spend an awful lot of time fighting themselves, fighting other, other libertarians, fighting other libertarians who have it wrong, Trotskyites fighting Stalinists, uh, fighting other kinds of Trotskyites, and so forth and so on. And part of that comes out of the idea that the movement has some pool of resources that have to be used in the right way. So if you're advocating the wrong strategy, you want to waste the resources that should be used for my strategy. And that's wrong. That if you think about the real world, there aren't libertarian resources. There are only the resources of individual libertarians. They are time and energy and money. And if what you're good at and what you want to do is politicking, is running candidates, whether in the hope of getting them elected or using them to spread ideas. And if I say that's wrong, what you ought to be doing is education. You won't do education, you'll do nothing. Similarly, if I don't like writing polit politics, and I don't, but I like educating people and writing books, and you say that's no good, what you got to do is run candidates, I won't do anything. So the right way, it seems to me, is that libertarianism itself ought to be a decentralized project in which different libertarians propose different ways of improving the world, and some libertarians are convinced by one and some by another, and each of them does those things that seem right for them or they think they're good at doing. So I would say that on the one hand, uh, the creation of the United Parcel Service and the Federal Express was a big step in favor of libertarianism, because it became much harder to say if we didn't have a government post office, the mail wouldn't be delivered when you know that there are private firms doing essentially the same job. Similarly, I would say that in a country where all the universities belong to the government, if you can successfully create a private university, that's a step towards a more libertarian society, uh, both because of what it will do directly and because people will be less inclined to say we have to have a government or we won't be educated. Uh, so the creating institutions is a way. But Ayn Rand did a great deal in favor of libertarianism by writing novels that people read and were inspired by. George Bernard Shaw did a good deal against libertarianism by writing plays uh, that people were convinced and inspired by. So if your ability is writing fiction, then writing fiction that embeds your ideas might be a good way of doing it. If you're good at running political candidates, then one of the things you might do is to work for candidates who can get elected who are not really libertarian, but are more libertarian than the alternative. A different thing you might do is to run candidates who can't get elected, but to use their campaigns as ways of spreading ideas. So you definitely see value in political action, not like some yes. anarcho capitals that are bashing their I, fellow libertarians. I, I, see, I see value in lots and lots of different things that you can do. That's right. The thing I don't see value for under most circumstances is violent revolution. I think that's likely to make things worse rather than better. But I think that mo at least the other strategies that people advocate, I think, are generally all ones that are of some use and different ones are probably of use for different people. Dr. Friedman, thank you for your time. Thank you.